I'd like to add another Skittle prayer, if that's okay. Maybe this is one you can do when you get home. Um, that our babies would both sleep at the same time. Um, if any of you saw them this morning, all through the morning service, they slept together perfectly fine, first time in days. Um, and pretty much as soon as we left, they decided to go back to normal. So, um, so yeah, next time you have a bag, bag of Skittles, if you have any spare prayers going, we would very much appreciate it. Now, I've done quite a lot recently. I've sort of just moved here. Before this, I was in Wales doing um, outdoor education stuff, climbing a lot of mountains and that kind of thing. And before that, I was doing something completely different. I was work, um, studying, and I was doing specifically museum work. So history, but with an eye of looking at museums, and I did a bit of a work experience thing before COVID came and shut all of that down. But what I was hoping to go off and do was look at working in a museum, specifically working with a collection, and to sort of be in charge of making sure that it's okay. And so when I went and did my work experience, it was at a, a place over in Kendall, that was what I was doing. I was looking at a collection of stuff which had been just shoved in a cupboard in the back of the museum for a while, and they wanted to do an expedition ex exhibit with it. And so they needed someone to catalog it all, make sure it's all in okay nick, and figure out how to display it. And that's what I would have done. I only did about four weeks of it, so about half of it got cleaned, and that's it. Um, presumably it's still in a cupboard. But what I learned through that sort of that year of uni and, and that time there was that there's a real difference between maintenance and restoration, Specific, especially when it comes to museum stuff. So if you're looking at an artifact and you're talking about maintenance, that is taking the object, or whatever it is, and making sure that it doesn't deteriorate any further. So you're trying to make sure that it doesn't get any worse, but you're mostly just trying to make sure it stays in the same condition. And 99% of what they do in museums is that kind of thing. They, you know, when they do their inventories, they take the object, they look at it, they see wh what kind of state it's in, make careful notes, take some photos, put it away, and hopefully, if they've done their job right, the next time someone takes it out and looks at it, it'll be in the same condition. Now, restoration is where you're taking something and you're improving it. You're trying to um, either fix something that's broken with it or maybe even try and bring it all the way back to what it was supposed to be when it was first created. Now, this was something that sort of came into my mind recently because I saw in the news, I don't know if anyone else has seen this, that next month, December 8th, they're gonna open Notre Dame again. So if we could have that first slide up. Anyone remember that back in uh, 2019, April? Still not sure why it caught on fire, but it did. Um, the whole, the big tower at the top came down, the roof completely destroyed. Um, as far as historians went, it was, it was a pretty sad day. Um, but it's been a really Im interesting thing sort of watching over the years as they've been restoring it. So in the first couple of days, they got over a billion dollars in sort of donations to restore it. So they've been, you know, they've had a good budget for it. They've gone and they've cut down um, nearly a whole forest of a thousand year old trees so that the wood that's being used for the new roof is as close to the original as they can get it. They're preparing all the wood with the same techniques that they would have done all the way back then. Like it's a, it's a proper big achievement that they've managed to restore it like they have. Um, and sometimes, you know, the people decide, oh, we're not going to restore something. Um, places with more troubled histories, um, you know, places, um, concentration camps from World War II or, or slave um, trading posts and that sort of thing, often important historical sites, but they kind of go, we'll maintain it. We'll kind of make sure it doesn't get any better, but nobody wants to see you know, a slave trading post with a new coat of paint on it. So yeah, this though is sort of a rare example of a restoration that has gone really, really well, seemingly. Um, they're not all so successful. And so I've got a few examples I'm gonna show of restorations that didn't quite go how they hoped. So, could we have the next one, please? Now, this is a statue of Mary and Jesus from a church in a small town in Canada. Now, in 2016, they were having an issue with hooligans. They had, um, presumably, teenagers on skateboards or similar vehicles um, coming by, and they'd knock off the head of the baby Jesus and ride away. And so then they'd have to come get their best superglue, stick it back on, 
and then the next day someone would knock it off again. It kept going on, kept going on. Um, the priest was very adamant that they didn't want to give in to the hooligans. And in the end, someone knocked the head off and took it with them. And so the priest went, right, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a new one. I'm going to find someone to do a new one. And um, a local artist called Heather Wise volunteered to make a new one. Um, and if you go to the next slide, this is what she came up with. That's uh, baby Jesus, everybody. Now, this got picked up by the media and, you know, everyone had a right laugh about it. Um, and in the end, actually, it got such a response that the person who nicked the original head brought it back <laughs> so that they could put that back on. Um, so, yeah. Although, I was actually, I read it, I saw an article a little while back um, from the artist who, who made this, and she said, first of all, she was adamant it was, a, it was you know, a temporary one. She was working on a much better one, of course. Um, but she actually said that, first of all, she's made quite a bit of money off the merchandise, and secondly, um, she's become a Christian through the process. So, you know, God can use anything. Um, <laughs> the next one, if you don't mind, this is a castle in Turkey. So on the left is what it used to look like. Um, it was starting to become a bit unsafe, quite crumbly. And the sort of local heritage group decided that rather than just maintain it, rather than just prop it up on the inside, try and make sure it stays as it is for as long as possible, they wanted to restore it to what it originally looked like. And they did. That on the right is what it looks like. Um, and apparently the local people really hate it now. Even though it's back to what it was supposed to be, this is, you know, technically a successful restoration. The local people reckon it looks too much like SpongeBob. <laughs> With like a little mustache. So, um, so yeah, even though it was done exactly to spec, exactly how they had it originally, not, not very popular. Um, this last one, if you've ever heard of an unsuccessful restoration, might be the one that you have heard of. This is a painting of Jesus in a, a small town in Spain, not by any particularly big artist, just a, a local artist from the area who in his local church decided to paint a picture of Jesus. Um, and it was named Eke Homo, so that is probably not how you pronounce it, but it's also um, Behold the Man. And so, um, and it was in this um, small church in a small town for, you know, since early 1900s, so about 100 years or so. And Eventually, it got more and more degraded, more and more degraded, and a little 80-year-old lady in the town decided that she didn't like that the picture of Jesus was becoming so degraded, and so she was going to restore it. And so when you're rest restoring an artwork, it's, it's really precise. You have to do the brush strokes as much as you can, exactly how the original artist did. She was fairly confident. She had a crack at it. Um, this is what it came out as. <laughs> it got nicknamed Eke Mono, which is Behold the Monkey in Spanish, um, tried her best. She, I don't think, took the um, media attention quite so well. I think um, she felt like people were taking the mick. But yeah, not, not maybe what the original artist had in mind. Now, restoration is also something we talk about in church. We talk about it in the context of Christianity. Um, and you know that brings up important questions of, well, what is God's plan for restoration. What does that mean for me? Like, can, can I be restored? Can we be restored? Um, and I'll talk about a bit more about this later, but about three years ago, this was something I was really wrestling with because I really kind of felt like, well, I can't be restored. Um, maybe, you know, feelings of just being really run down or like things just aren't going to get better and they can't get better. Um, maybe just feeling like, you know, you hear people talking about God creating us perfectly, but I've done too much and I can't, I can't get back to that. Um, and something that really helped me is, is looking actually at Ezekiel. So, the book of Ezekiel, it's written to the exiled Israelites from Jerusalem. So they have, after hundreds and hundreds of years of turning their back on God and turning their back on God's covenant, he's finally come true on his word. He's said, right, well, if you're not going to live as, as, as people who 
you know, represent me, then I'm going to do what I promised and I'm going to send you out of the land. And so, sorry, you can, I will have to leave that because I didn't put a blank slide next. I didn't think about that. Sorry. Um, yeah, Nebuchadnezzar, 90, uh, 90, 597 BC, um, took a good number of the Israelites out of Jerusalem, sent them all the way to Babylon. Um, and then not long after that, Jerusalem actually gets completely destroyed. And so the book of Ezekiel is writing to these exiled Israelites, and it sounds like, based on the book of Ezekiel, one of their common sort of complaints and, and worries was that they were um, dried out, that sort of God had, had cast them aside, and, and that, that was it. You know, there wasn't much more that God could do with them. They'd screwed up, they'd messed up, they're done. You know, Israel is going to never be restored. Um, Ezekiel himself is an interesting guy. He um, was from the line of families that would have been priests. So, um, and there's a bit of evidence that his first vision and his last vision might have lined up with sort of becoming 30 and becoming 50, which was the boundaries of being a priest. Um, and so he was almost filling that role for them in the exile. But a running criticism of Israel was that they had a heart of stone, that they just were incapable of changing, of turning back, of, of following what God was saying to them. Um, and much of Israel's prof uh, sorry, Ezekiel's prophecies make clear that God intended to restore Israel back the way they were, were um, as part of his, uh, sort of showing his glory, but that it wouldn't just be maintenance. You know, maintenance would have been bringing Israel back to where they were as they were. And actually, the book of Ezekiel, as we'll have a look at, says, no, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring you back and I'm going to restore you. I'm going to bring you back and you're going to be different than you were before. So in chapter 36, we could have that up. Oh, look at that. What's up? In chapter 36, it says this, um, for I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into the land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. And so, yeah, just this idea that actually, you know, this heart of stone, this kind of reminder, even like Pharaoh gets described as having a heart of stone, doesn't he? Um, God's going to gonna fix that. And so the way that he shows this is he takes Ezekiel in a vision to a valley. And this is sort of, if you know anything from the book of Ezekiel, this will be the one that you know. Um, so can we have the next one? There we go. Um, he is taken, you can read that if you like. Um, he is taken into a, in a vision into a valley full of bones. And um, God sort of comes to him and says, can these bones live? And Ezekiel, being quite clever, sort of goes, I don't know, maybe. Um, now, it makes clear later on that these bones in the valley are supposed to be Israel. They sort of represent what Israel is like in the exile. You know, this complaint that they were dried out. They're there, they're, you know, they've been there a long time. Nothing really that you can do with a bunch of dry bones. You know, they're, they're past their prime, as it were. Um, and you know, God says to them, well, can they live? Um, Ezekiel says, I don't know. Um, and then God gives him a prophecy to say to the bones. And it's very similar to the one that he had just explained was going to Israel. You know, um, I'll make breath into you, you'll come to life. I'll put breath in you and you'll come to life. Um, and so Ezekiel does this. He, he says the words of God to the bones. And what happens is they reform. They turn back into bodies. They stand up. But they're not alive. Yeah? They've been maintained. They've gone back to what they were before they got exiled, but they aren't any different. You wouldn't even call them alive. Um, you could go to the next one, sorry. There you go. Um, there was no breath in them. 
And then God says, okay, prophesy to the breath. Now, the Hebrew word for breath is ruach. And it's pr- the same word really as is used for spirit. So when it talks about the, the spirit of God being above the waters in Genesis 1, it's, it's ruach. It's, it's that same thing. And so once the breath gets involved, once the spirit gets involved, that's when they actually come back to life. The impressive looking bit where they, you know, turn from dry skeletons back into people is just when they hear the word of God. It's when the breath gets involved that they actually become something again. Um, and it is a, it's a resurrection. It's a becoming something new, really. They, they had died, but they're now back. And, you know, if you've read much of the New Testament, this is a, a, a something that really gets grabbed a hold of and used a lot later. This is kind of a, a signpost of, for God talking about what he's going to do with Jesus. Um, and so God's plan was not only to give them life, but a new one. It's a kind of a recreation of the Genesis story, you know, being created from dust and breath back into people. Um, now, obviously, for the Israelites, amazing news. Yeah? You're worried that God's not going to be able to restore you. You're worried that this is kind of the end for you. Here's a message saying, I'm going to not only bring you back to life, but I'm going to put my spirit in you. I'm going to put my breath in you, and you're going to become something new. And, you know, you could say, okay, well, great. That's great news for the Israelites, but what does that mean for us? Well, actually, when you then look at what happens to the exiles when they go back to Israel, you can tell that this kind of change doesn't happen. They go back to Israel. They rebuild the temple they rebuild the walls for Jerusalem. Um, you can, you know, Ezra and Nehemiah do a great job of telling that story. And, the, and they really try. But the end of the book of Nehemiah specifically makes very clear that the Israelite people aren't, still aren't in a good place. They're still getting the same things wrong. They're, you know, turning back from God's commandments. This change which has been promised hasn't happened. It's not until the New Testament with Jesus that we actually see this change happen. And so, unlike a, you know, a, a lot of the Old Testament where you can say, oh, well, that's only for the Israelites. Actually, I really believe that this promise is something that applies for us as well. This isn't a specific only to those exiled people. This is something that he was promising just as a general change. Um, Um, <laughs> you don't you hate it when you think that you've written something down and you haven't? Anyone know Second Corinthians five seventeen off the top of their head? Thank you, I knew there was somebody. <laughs> oh, that's a relief. Um, yeah. Therefore, if anyone was in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away; the new has come. You know, when they're talking about that, they're hearkening back. To this sort of idea of being made new. And ultimately, that's what Jesus came for. He came to restore us. He came so that we wouldn't just be the same as we are when we hear God's word, but that we can actually, when we make that decision and, and choose to follow God, that he can change our heart. He can give us a heart where we can actually then follow up on that. About three years ago, I realized I wasn't really quite in that place. Um, I just moved away. I was in the middle of Wales, in the middle of nowhere. And it turns out when you're in the middle of Wales, in the middle of nowhere, that's quite a good place to just, you can't really escape from God very well there. Um, And I just got really challenged by this thing of, I wasn't letting God restore me. You know, I was, I was trying my best to be a Christian. I was, I'd, I'd you know, been trying all my life, really, but I was 
worried. I'm not somebody that likes change, which is presumably why I've now, you know, had twins and moved and started a new job um, all in the space of about a month and a half. So don't say he doesn't have a sense of humor. But um, yeah, there was a part of me that was very hesitant and reluctant to sort of let God fix me, I guess, as it was. You know, my prayer when I was struggling was, God, please don't let this get any worse, you know, or, 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 you know, can't things just go back to then? And I'd point to a specific time where things were a little bit better. But actually, that's not what God's asking to do with us. He's asking to completely restore us, to give us that, that new life, that new, you know, creation that is completely different. I've got a red jacket looks like this. It's red. Um, it is my mum's least favorite of my hoodies. <laughs> that just needs to be said, first of all. It is about 13 years old. Um, I definitely wore it to high school, so that says something. And it's also my favorite because it, it's just comfortable. I'm used to it. It's falling apart. It's, um, I think that's a milk stain, <laughs> probably, from my babies. Um, and, you know, if I was to try and maintain this, I could just make sure that none of these get any bigger, that none of the stains get any bigger, um, and I could probably continue with this hoodie for a lot longer. I could keep going. To restore it would be a lot more work. It would mean restitching all these bits. It would mean giving it a proper deep clean wash. And actually, what I'd have at the end of it wouldn't be this jacket anymore. You know, it wouldn't be maybe as comfortable and familiar as it is right now. But it would be better. And I think that's God's challenge to us, is that he wants to restore us. He wants to fix what we might feel like is broken, and or what is broken. He wants to... Bring us back to what we were supposed to be, what we're designed to be. And there's nothing that we've done that can get in the way of that. But we have to let him. Yeah? We can't just keep going with maintenance. Because eventually things will just fall apart. We need that restoration. We need that new, that spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. We need that new creation. And when we have it, it's so much better. It's maybe not exactly the same as it was before, but the changes are for the better. Um, but God won't do it, I don't think, unless we let him. Um, St. Augustine, and I did get this up on my phone just to make sure I really didn't get it wrong. It's not a very long quote. Um, said, without God, we cannot, but without us, God will not. You know, this is what I was challenged with three years ago or so, was not so much that God was saying to me, oh, I'm, I can't restore you, but he was saying, I can't unless you, unless you let me, or I won't unless you let me. And actually, the journey I've been on since then of, of letting God do that has been hard, but it's also bared amazing fruit. And I am different than I was three, four years ago. And it's still a process, but I'm so glad I did. And so that's really the message I wanted to get across tonight, is that this promise of, you know, a new creation of, of God's spirit coming and not just keeping us as we are, not just making sure that, you know, things don't get any worse, but actually restoring us. You know, compare some of those rubbish restorations to what I was saying about Notre Dame. You know, that's what God wants for us. He wants to bring us back to what we were supposed to be, what we were designed to be, and we need to let him. So, I'll just pray, and then band is coming back up. Yes. Brill. Lord, I thank you that you want to restore us. 
I thank you that um, even when we might feel like we don't know what we're doing or what's going on or just helpless, just like things are falling apart or we're falling apart and, and we just desperately want to try and stay as we are or just hold everything still. I thank you that your promise isn't to do that. I thank you that your promise is to come and to bring real restoration, to do hard work and, you know, not just surface work, but to make us into new creations, people that can follow your commands, people who can engage with you. I thank you for that, Lord. And I pray that, you know, if there's anyone here that, that maybe hasn't opened that to you before, that hasn't felt comfortable letting you, that, that they would, Lord. I pray that you would give them the courage and the, the reassurance to, to let you come and to restore them. And Lord, if there's anyone here, you know, like me, that is, is on that journey, because it is a journey, Lord, um, I pray that you would just continue the work you're doing, that you show us places where maybe we're getting in the way or we're not handing things to you, Lord. Amen. Your heart.